Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in warmly welcoming our guest speaker, Alan Joyce, CEO of Qantas. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for a very good uh, introduction. And uh, Michael, spot on. I, I have to say, when I was uh, growing through the aviation industry, I became a fanatic to collect timetables. Um, uh, it's, it sounds like a strange thing, but, uh, uh, but the aviation industry, uh, I think, in terms of the collection of timetables, I thought was very exciting. And then I discovered, when I met John Travolta for the first time, he's an avid timetable collector. So we had something very much in common from day, from day one. Now, John takes it to a new extreme, just again, as far as an intro on this. Uh, John uh, collected the timetables as a kid growing up uh, in New Jersey, and the timetables for him became a way of relaxing. So he, even this, to this day, will take a classical timetable, maybe a Qantas timetable from the 1950s. He'd look at a flight in the timetable, and he would imagine a passenger traveling on that flight from somewhere exotic to somewhere else exotic and create a story around it. It's probably one of the reasons why he's such a creative artist and why he does, he does so well. But that's why he has a passion for aviation and that's why he has a passion for Qantas. So collecting timetables is a good thing. <laughs> don't, don't joke about it. Uh, thank you today um, for, for hosting uh, this event uh, to the Press Club. Uh, today I'd like to kick off uh, talking about the Qantas year by taking you through some of our key agenda items for 2011. Of course, we will be building on the progress made last year when a number of important things for us occurred. We introduced our groundbreaking next generation check-in system. We saw our domestic and regional businesses perform unbelievably strongly in the environment around the world, with Qantas having the most profitable and the second most profitable carriers operating in the domestic market. We consolidated our Qantas Frequent Flyer program. It now has a massive 7.5 million members and it penetrates over half the host households in the Australian market which is a penetration that no other airline in the world would see. We grew Jetstar aggressively at home and abroad. We trebled our underlying profit for our 2009 and 10 annual results, and we were only one of two airlines in the world to maintain an investment grade credit rating, which was an amazing achievement through one of the toughest times in aviation. And most importantly of all, we celebrated 90 years of continuous airline operations. No other airline in the world has operated for 90 years continuously, and it's a great credit to this little airline that started in Longreach all those years ago that's become such an international recognized brand and one of the biggest airlines operating in the world. This year, Part of our broader strategy will be focused on a number of key activities. First of all, navigating the recovery, positioning the group in Asia, securing the future of Qantas International, engaging our workforce and strengthening our brand. I'd like to begin with the recovery. The Qantas group is a portfolio business. Our premium and low fares airlines, our loyalty program, and our freight business all contribute to Qantas' success. Together, the two airlines form a natural hedge for our business. They help us to succeed through the upswings and the downturns. Now with that, we are in recovery, but, many, but like many of our customers, we do remain cautious about the prospects ahead. US employment is still above 9%. It is not clear to what extent the European debt crisis will affect European growth. And while Chinese growth continues to be good news, China faces a big challenge in managing its own internal asset bubbles and inflation concerns. As a result, the aviation outlook 
reflects this mixed scenario. Globally, there has been a significant improvement in revenues, but the International Air Transportation Association is cautious about forecasting a smooth upward path for aviation. There are concerns that a weakened Europe will offset the strong Asia-Pacific growth. Aviation as an industry is struggling to deliver sustained competitiveness. Consolidation is still too difficult in large parts of the world, and there are short and long-term challenges in managing security and the environment. Fuel prices have become a major issue for the industry yet again. Crude oil prices are currently trading at the highest levels since the global financial crisis. The Qantas Group has a big exposure to fuel prices. We spend over $3 billion a year on fuel, and we're the largest purchaser of liquid fuel in Australia by a good bit. And although the exchange rate movements partially offset the impact, the Australian dollar is a commodity currency, and it usually rises in line with fuel prices and helps give us a competitive advantage against some of our peers. However, over the past four months, the Australian dollar has only appreciated by 6%, while the jet fuel price has risen by around 24%. Today, we announce an increase in fuel surcharges for Qantas international flights, ranging between $20 and $50 one way, the first such increase since January 2008. This follows a move by other airlines, including Singapore Airlines and British Airways, who have increased the fuel charge this year. We don't do this lightly and it comes after four fuel surcharges decreases over the past three years. On the Jetstar side, Jetstar is committed to offering the lowest airfares, and we will address the fuel price issue via selective changes to airfares and increases in ancillary revenues, including baggage charges, similar to how most low-cost airlines around the world are addressing the issue today. As a group, we will be monitoring the situation and we cannot rule out further changes in the future. The Australian economy is performing well relative to the rest of the globe. Of course, the economic impact of the Victorian, New South Wales and the Queensland floods not to mention the devastating impact of, tro of tropical um, cyclone Yazzie is not yet clear. The human cost has been terrible, and our hearts do go out to all of those that have been impacted. Qantas, of course, um, as the national carrier, has come uh, and invested quite heavily in trying to help in all of the regions involved. In Queensland, we have donated a million dollars to the Premier's Relief Fund, and we have made an offer um, to, uh, to uh, add additional flights in the coming days um, as the airports open up in relation to the cyclone. That amounts to a significant, uh, a significant offer of free seats over um, a five-day period, totaling over 1,500 uh, free seats to get rescue crews into the local destination. Here in Victoria, we've also today made a commitment to donate $250,000 in cash to the relief fund and $250,000 in, in uh, benefit in kind uh, through offering flights and other assistance, totaling half a million dollars to help in what's happened here in the Victorian floods. In economic terms, there will be a stimulus effect as reconstruction gets underway. There may be a negative impact on mining, farming and agriculture. Our retailers are already reporting a negative impact on discretionary spending. Finally, there is a question of inflationary pressures 
as a consequence through the broader, broader economy with food and skill shortages adding to that pressure as a result of the floods and the cyclone. Now to the Qantas group. Domestically, we are very strong. We are building upon our 65% domestic market share across our two airlines, which, as I said, are the most profitable operating in the domestic market. Business and corporate travel has rebounded for us and is helping the Qantas brand in particular. Overall, domestic capacity has increased by more than 10% this year, with the Qantas Group a major participant, and it's forecast to grow by as much as 11% next year, and we will be contributing to that growth in order to maintain our market share. In the leisure market, some have walked away, providing a major opportunity for Jetstar as the leading low fares carrier. With Qantas Domestic, we are seeing the results of investing hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade our offering to our most valued customers. We launch our next generation check-in here in Melbourne over the next two weeks, and we've completed a lot of work upgrading our terminals and lounges around the country. For example, in Perth, we've actually spent over $75 million in the last two years upgrading the terminal facilities there. And we are aligning our domestic and international business products so that our business customers enjoy a consistent offering at home and overseas. Qantas Link, our regional operator, is a quiet achiever in the portfolio. With 42 turboprops and 11 jets, Qantas Link is part of life in regional and rural Australia, selecting, selecting and servicing 54 different destinations. An additional seven aircraft will be, have been ordered at the end of 2009-2010, and they start arriving this year. So we see significant growth for that business over the next couple of years. Queensland and the mining industry growth has been very important to recent Qantas linked success. And we have been doing very good business in New South Wales with that operation. Very recently, we required network aviation to build our presence in Western Australia, and particularly in the resource industry and the fly-in, fly-out business. And we will be making a number of significant announcements about our growth plan for that business over the next few weeks. I should also say that the focus on Western Australia also continues with Qantas Link. Yesterday, we announced a new service from Perth to Exmount on top of the eight intra-WA destinations that we serve. And this month, we'll be adding 7,000 extra seats to intra-WA operations, a significant commitment to our regional operations in Western Australia. Talking a bit about now Jetstar. Jetstar in Australia and New Zealand is surging ahead. It added 14 extra A320 aircraft last year, which has grown its fleet to 50 narrow-body aircraft, just in this region alone. Its projected growth of more than 30% in the forthcoming year in the Australian and New Zealand domestic markets shows the potential and the growth opportunities that we have for this great business. Qantas Freight is performing solidly, coming out of the economic downturn, although it has also been impacted by the grounding of the A380s. It currently operates four 737 freighters domestically, three dedicated 747 freighters, and we've just acquired a new growth vehicle in a 767 branded Qantas freighter. So our Qantas domestic businesses and freight operations are strong today and are extremely well positioned for the future. Now to Asia. We all know that Australia's future is tied up in Asia, with, and with China in particular. 
six of Qantas, uh, six of Australia's top ten trading partners are currently in Asia. But if we want to make the most of this incredible opportunity, we need to take a broad approach that embraces trade and investment, tourism and culture, research and education. Strong aviation links will play their part in building these broader and deeper ties. The Qantas Group plans to contribute to Australia's Asia future and also to benefit from it. We are already laying the groundwork with our investments in Jetstar's operation in Asia. And Jetstar has an aggra aggressive pan-Asian growth strategy, which I believe has huge potential. It is already Asia's largest low-cost carrier by, by revenue. Next month, Jetstar will be flying from Singapore to 25 different destinations in 13 different countries, including seven destinations in the greater China area. An amazing success for a company and a thought that was only a business plan just seven years ago. Jetstar Pacific also serves seven destinations in Vietnam with a high growth economy of 87 million people. Now to put Jetstar's success in context, at this stage of its evolution, having operated for less than seven years, it is bigger than Ryanair, EasyJet and Southwest War at that stage of their evolution. It is on a huge growth trajectory and could be a massive carrier in the Asia Pacific region. Jetstar's approach will be the same as it has been over the last seven years. It will be to sustain its fast growth while at the same time keeping costs down. It has reduced its cost base every year of operation since it started back in 2004. It will build up its brand strength in Asia. It already has one of the top 100 new brands in Japan. It will develop its interlining and co-chair arrangements to give it distribution across the globe. Recently, it signed its 21st interline partner with Finnair. So amazingly, in Helsinki, you can actually book a Jetstar flight through Asia um, using um, the co-chair arrangements that exist. So its distribution has gone global. But it's not only Jetstar that has a lot of potential in booming Asia. We think that premium airlines will also have a significant role to play. Asian consumption is currently 70% of the United States and it's forecast to grow to 140% within the next 10 years. Substantial proportions of the Chinese and Indian populations already have significant purchasing power. Last year, a massive 56 million Chinese people traveled abroad. But what's outstanding about that market is that the Chinese outbound travel market is expected to grow by 16% every year until 2020. That's an unbelievable opportunity for air transportation in the region. India too has a young and affluent consumer base. And we are looking very closely at all possibilities to participate in this Asian growth opportunity to benefit ourselves, our customers, our shareholders, and Australia. The long-term future of freight will also be about Asia. China is obviously key, and we have significant rights from China to the United States in carrying freight, but Qantas Freight is also doing business in Singapore, Bangkok, and Shanghai, and just added a Seoul to Miami service, uh, which is performing well. Qantas Freight is also expanding its potential in Asia using the Jetstar Asia belly space to give her a comprehensive offering throughout the Asian market. Now turning to Qantas International. Obviously the incident last year and the subsequent grounding of the A380 fleet was a major setback for Qantas. But the issue has been fully resolved with the satisfaction of the manufacturer, Rolls-Royce, all relevant authorities, 
and with our own experts. This was an engine manufacturer issue, and we are currently in dialogue about how we get compensation for that issue. Today, we're fully back to flying, and we have every confidence in the A380, and the fleet will grow to at least 11 aircraft by August of this year. That will allow us to support the great demand for the A380 from our customer base on both our London and Los Angeles routes. And what's very pleasing is since the aircraft have come back into operation, we've actually seen the demand similar um, to, to, the, to the demand that was there before the grounding. People are seeking out the A380, they see it as a destination in its own right, and they are booking the aircraft uh, because of the desirability of the product and, and what that means to them. So as a result of that, in September, we will start and commence our fleet reconfiguration program to translate those premium A380 features into our 747 fleet. Our aim is to have a consistently excellent product, both on all of the international fleet, offering the same in-flight product on, in the air and on the ground. Michael mentioned that we are looking forward to getting the first of the 787s for the Qantas group at the end of the year. This is going to be great for a business and for a customer. It will help us simplify our fleet across both of our airlines with significant fuel and maintenance savings. Our customers will enjoy the improved flying experience with bigger windows, lower cabin pressure, and more direct flights to more destinations. It is truly a step change in aircraft technology, one that we haven't seen in a generation. I've seen some speculation that Qantas leaders made an error back in 2000 and 2005 by committing the group to the latest aircraft types in the A380s and the 747s. Absolutely don't believe it. It's not true. The company's greatness is based on being first with the best aircraft. Throughout our entire history, the leaders of the Qantas were at the forefront of taking advantage of new technology. And we wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't take that advantage. For example, we were the first airline outside the United States to fly the 707. It was the first jet aircraft operated by Qantas and the first jet aircraft operated outside the sta States. Talk about leading edge use of technology. And we are proud to lead in that way again today. Our network continues to grow, giving our customers better connections and more destinations on the regional, domestic, and international travel. As Michael also mentioned, we recently announced the introduction of new services from Australia to Dallas starting this May. This is going to be a massive opportunity because Dallas is American Airlines' biggest hub and American are a great partner of Qantas's. To put the size of Dallas in perspective, American Airlines flies 7,500 flights a day to 180 destinations, and it will be the best way to connect throughout the United States and to other destinations, because it is built as a connecting airport. It is going to be a great opportunity also for Australians to fly there with the uh, strong Australian dollar. So I think Ken Ryan and the sales team over there We'll be very glad if you can actually book as many trips out of, um, out of here. From a customer's perspective, therefore, we are very confident in the quality of our international business. But the fact is, in a financial sense, we are failing, sig falling significantly short of where we should be. Capacity has flooded into the Australian market from China, the Middle East, and other Asian markets. To give you an idea, the total growth in direct aviation capacity into Australia between 2003 and 2009 was a massive 39%. Now that would be great if we were filling it with big inbound traffic flows. 
But the fact is the total inbound tra uh, traffic growth was only about 10% during that period. So that tells us that these carriers are not growing the market, but simply taking existing demand. And the result is that the Qantas, grew, the Qantas international market share has fallen from 35% to 20%. Meanwhile, the majority of our Qantas assets are tied up in this part of the business, and it currently today absorbs the largest amount of our capital expenditure. As an end of the line carrier, with a population here in Australia of 22 million people, in a marketplace flooded by so much capacity, with our competition not even using their full quotas, we do face severe limits on our, gro on our growth in this segment of our business. If we continue on our current path, there will be a real question mark over the viability of Qantas International. And I have no intention of letting our flagship business decay through lack of action. We have set up a task force headed by one of our senior executives, Leslie Grant, to explore options that will invigorate this business, generate new and profitable markets, and protect our jobs and assets. Qantas is a great national and international airline. It is time we looked at opportunities to become a, a great global airline. In all that we do, our workforce is central to our success. Bringing, about, bringing out the best on, in everybody in Qantas is a priority. The Qantas workforce totals 35,000 people, 93% of which are based here in Australia. There is a bit of a myth developing that we've sent all our engineering and maintenance work offshore. Tell that to the thousands of Qantas engineers employed here in Australia. Frankly, this myth wouldn't worry me if it were true because all of the world's other great airlines do their maintenance outside of Australia. Aviation is a global high-tech industry and there are centers of engineering and maintenance excellence around the world. But the fact is that last year we undertook 93% of all of our maintenance here in Australia and over 80% of the heavy maintenance was conducted here in this country. Far from a disappearing offshore, we have an engineering community of more than 5,500 people, including 357 apprentices and a further 60 to commence training this month. So we are actively investing in the long-term future of onshore maintenance and engineering, just as we invest in the training and skill maintenance of our pilots, cabin crew and others. This major investment in our people pays off in the renowned quality of our skills. But it also reflects in the low attrition rate, which means that we don't have the high turnover costs faced by some other companies. This year we'll be negotiating a number of major industrial relations agreements. And like many Australian companies, we are looking at a tightening skills market and this is putting pressure on many industrial frameworks. Our aim will be to bring our people with us as we continue to innovate and improve our business. Finally, I want to say a few words about the Qantas brand. Qantas was certainly heard during the events of last year, and we have a lot of rebuilding to do. We never take the loyalty of our customers for granted. Every day, we work hard to earn and to keep that trust. <coughs> Having said that, our research shows that our customers have been very understanding about the events around the QF32 in November. As you know, we reacted to the situation in accordance with our values by putting safety first and grounding our A380 fleet. We also made sure that we communicated openly and honestly with our customers through all available channels. 
We wanted our customers to know exactly what was happening and why. As a result of this approach, we have seen our, re our brand rebound quite quickly. Our customers understood and appreciate our safety first approach. And as Michael said, you know, we were very proud of how our crews in particular handled this event. But it was the people all over Qantas that handled it magnificently. The captains on board that aircraft had an amazing task to do when the error messages and the, the list occurred. And I was talking to Michael earlier about the two hours that they spent uh, working through their checklists, working through calmly and collectively what they needed to do. But what's amazing to me is that when the aircraft landed, the captain in charge, Richard de Crepne, came out of the cockpit, talked to the passengers, and handed his mo personal mobile phone details to every passenger so that they could ring him if they had a problem. Now, after what he just had to deal with, that was amazing that his first thought was about the customers on board the aircraft. One of the other captains, Dave Evans, uh, that was on that aircraft, um, volunteered to do the first flight of the A380 nine days later when they went back in the air. We had a lot of media interest on that flight. And Dave uh, agreed to do the press conference with me, probably, I think, the seventh one that we had done that week. And at the press conference, uh, the, the press then discovered that David was one of the pilots on the QF-32. And he asked them the obvious questions. Was the QF-32 the most scariest moment you ever had in your life? Were you petrified uh, when you were on that aircraft? And classically, Dave says, no, I wasn't petrified. That wasn't the most scariest moment in my life. This press conference is the most scariest <laughs> moment in my life. And he went on to say, that was just what I was trained to do, and I did as per my training and handled it very well. And I think it's classical in the way the Qantas pilots handle these things, and the trainings come true to the forefront. Any good business also from, uh, from a local corner store to the biggest corporate has a role to play in the community. It's about being part of the neighborhood. Well, Australia is our neighborhood, and Qantas is there when Australia needs us at home and overseas. We had the practical contributions I mentioned earlier to flood rescue and relief here in Victoria, but also in New South Wales and in Queensland. We are evacuating Australians from Cairo on behalf of the Australian government and providing free flights to Australians to get home. So last night, we did transport back um, 190 Australians from Cairo to Frankfurt, and we're now in the process of giving them uh, free flights to get back here to Australia if they need or require it. Tonight, another flight departs. Um, it will be, at this stage, it looks like it will be a full flight. Um, and we're expecting uh, the same process to go through very, sm very smoothly. One of our people said what, was, what brought home to me the power of the Qantas brand is that the passengers were saying when they saw the kangaroo in Cairo on the ground, the relief and the, the amazing sight it was one of the best sights they had seen in a long time. Um, we are very proud to be part of a company can, that can do something like that and can have an impact on people's daily lives. And for people to have that emotional effect when they see an aircraft in an airport like Cairo uh, that, and, and that they know that they're going to be looked after and taken home is something very special and something that Qantas is very proud to do. So we do support our fellow, fellow Australians around the world we have the resources and skills and the know-how to really go to anywhere in the world and do what we need to do to help Australians. We're always there, ready to help. So let me conclude. The Qantas Group has made an annual profit every year since 1995. Only two other major full-service carriers in the world can also match that claim, Singapore and Emirates both offering, operating under very different models. We have new aircraft arriving with many more to come. Our Australian domestic base is very sound and we have a skilled and stable workforce. We are laying the groundwork 
to maximize the enormous opportunities in Asia. And there will no doubt be challenges ahead. There always are. But the underlying strength, resilience, and potential of the Qantas group is the real story. Our portfolio allows us to succeed no matter what aviation throws at us. From economic cycles to fuel price rises and even natural disasters. Our portfolio sets us apart from our competition and gives us tremendous potential for the future. I can assure you we'll continue to unlock that potential in 2011. Thank you very much for your time. Ellen, thank you very much. Ellen is very kindly going to now take some questions from the floor. The only thing that I would ask you is if you could identify yourself and your organisation before you ask your question. There's a couple of roving mics in the room. And we'll start over here. Hi, I'm Mal Maiden from The Age. If the portfolio is uh, Qantas' strongest asset, why did the group spend so much time looking at spinning pieces of it out? Um, I, I think we, we did in the past have look at, look at times of spinning it out. Uh, APA, when it occurred, uh, did occur in a different environment and a different world. And the concept in APA was that the, uh, the sum of the parts in Qantas was worth more than the whole. And that, as a consequence, you could release more shareholder value uh, by, um, by selling components of the group. I think the world changed after the global financial crisis. Uh, every, a lot of the assumptions that were there in APA were no longer valid. Uh, we saw uh, that through the cycle, uh, the annuity businesses that we had, like Qantas Frequent Flyer and Jetstar, which is a very stable earning business, gave us solid cash flows and solid earnings that compensated for the volatility in the, in the full service business. And it meant that we could keep our, um, our, our, our profitability through the period, relying on those businesses and, and, and position as well for the upturn when it did occur by continuing investing in the full service airline. Uh, we also saw uh, that, um, that our, our investment grade credit rating was maintained because we had solid cash flows from those businesses. So the world is a different place after the global financial crisis. And we've said we have no intention of hiving off uh, the frequent flyer business or Jetstar. Um, any core businesses um, that are there, we will keep. Um, some of the other assets that we have, like our travel agency business, uh, we need to do something different with that, and that doesn't fall into the same category, because we're an airline. I think we do. We run airlines very good. Uh, Frequent Flyer is a core component of that, uh, and we will focus in on those assets, and I think there's a lot more value that we can deliver on those assets. So the hiving off of those assets is definitely off the agenda. Uh, Alan, thank you. My name's Rob Jell. I've had the pleasure of working for three different commercial television newsrooms in the past. And now I'm a small business owner in environmental uh, business strategy development. I doubt that there's been a previous Qantas CEO who has discussed the business impact of extreme weather events. And I could add another one being the Icelandic volcanic eruption um, in such a way as you have done today. If by some remarkable uh, chain of events, either the Australian people or the Australian government delivers a carbon price in Australia, what will that do to ticket prices or will you buy fuel overseas? Um, it, it doesn't make a difference where we buy fuel in terms of w w what, a, uh, what a carbon tax would entail. Um, a carbon tax uh, w would increase, I mean the whole intention through a carbon tax would be uh, to, to price carbon appropriately and that would have an impact on airfares, it would have an impact um, it would have an impact on what the consumer pays because it would become part of our cost base. Uh, we are very actively involved in our impact and minimising our impact on the environment, uh, which would also uh, reduce the CO2 emissions and any potential uh, uh, carbon tax that, that could come in. For example, we're spending $17 billion on new aircraft, uh, which have, we mentioned the 787, have an unbelievable fuel efficiency that will reduce our CO2 emissions. We, we're, we are involved now in testing uh, and signed up for two new sustainable uh, aviation fuels. Uh, one using uh, rubbish for rubbish dumps here in, uh, from in Sydney, 
uh, which we can convert into an aviation fuel, we believe. Um, we can also um, we can also look at we're looking at one with sugar cane, the, the residue from sugar cane. Uh, we believe that you know over the next 20 years, a large proportion of our fuel needs to become from sustainable um, sustainable fuel sources, and there's going to be big investments placed into that to make it happen. And then we're doing everything that we can on the aircraft to reduce the weight. Uh, to reduce the CO, uh, to, to gain the CO2 emissions. We've got new li lightweight carts on the aircraft uh, for catering uh, that really cut back on the weight. Um, and then we're working with air traffic control on new satellite navigation systems that again reduce the flight path. We, when we're all flying between Melbourne and Sydney, we know how long we stay in the air circling. Um, we, need to, we need to eliminate that. So one of, our, one of our key areas is that if there is going to be a money raised from carbon tax, we'd like it to be net neutral to the consumers overall as a principle. We'd like it, um, any money that's raised, also to have a, an involvement and investment back in the areas where it has a real impact on CO2 emissions, like a new um, air traffic management system in Australia. We have the ability to do that, and that can reduce CO2 emissions absolutely amazingly. So this money needs to be used for the right purpose if it does happen. Yes, Russell Knoll, um, Melbourne Press Club, with a particular interest in transport reporting. I understand the Melbourne-Sydney sector is somewhere around about in the first six international busy sectors of the world. And I'm wondering, in Qantas's future strategy, where do you see the impact of fast rail in other words, one and a half hours from Sydney to Melbourne, and two, uh, which is a, uh, a probably a very specific question to Melbourne, should we have a fast rail in from our airport into the city? Um, good question. So the fir first question, uh, we, we do look, Garrett, and we've looked at research that's taken place and what's happened in different markets around the world uh, when fast rail has been introduced in some high volume cities. And I think there's a few differences here in Australia. First of all, air transportation is very convenient compared to some of the other international markets that were bigger than Melbourne, Sydney. I think Melbourne, Sydney is the third largest city pair in the world. It's an amazing volume of uh, traffic between the two. Um, London, Paris used to be bigger. And then the Eurotunnel was created and the volumes dropped off dramatically and people went to the rail. But, but, but that was because it was an international sector and you know the inconvenience if, if you work out the timing involved of having to go through the airport, clear, uh, uh, clear the various channels to get onto the aircraft and the congestions that are at airports like Heathrow. Here we have a very good on-time performance for the carriers operating. Qantas last year had its top on-time performance of 15 years domestically. Uh, they rate in the top two or three on-time performances around the world. Uh, we know the, with the next generation check-in, we know how convenient it is now to just go through our airports. So the timing involved and the timing saving is, is not hugely convenient compared to was to some of these other options. And there are other markets in the world uh, where fast rail and, and huge airport transportation um, actually operate hand in hand. You take the Japanese, who are the, who are the creators of it, um, who have unbelievable speed with the, with the bullet trains, they, they still operate 747s uh, between two of their largest cities with 550 people on board them because they can't get enough demand for air transportation between those two cities. So I, t I think it can live in harmony, and I think it means that we have to be a lot more attractive in terms of what we provide to the customers in terms of the air transportation proposition, and things like the next generation check-in are absolutely doing that for us. Um, in terms of the rail link to Melbourne, I'd be absolutely keen on it. I think it's great uh, that we're going to have something to Avalon as well. I think it's going to be great for, for Jetstar. Um, it will speed up um, uh, the, the, the op opportunities there. I think Melbourne needs one, and I think it would be fantastic if Melbourne had a high-speed link as well. Alan, John McKenna from Better Access Consulting. Hey, First of all, congratulations on your achievements. I sit here as a very proud Australian as a person that lives in Australia, of course, and um, share your passion with Qantas. Can I just touch very quickly on customer segmentation yes. um, in relation to people with mobility restrictions 
Um, I guess it's probably one of the smallest segments that we have, that you may have, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess my question is curious to know what's coming across your desk in relation to some of the challenges that people do have. Um, a colleague of mine, Mr Gray Minnis, who is the Human Rights Disability Commissioner, um, unfortunately his, loves his cricket and he did a scorecard the other day about how things have progressed for people with disabilities and as, as a whole, air travel has unfortunately gone a little bit backwards in relation to how we deliver it to people with mobility restrictions. So I'm, I'm just, I guess if I could hone down my question, um, what's coming across your desk and what are your views? And I also at the same time acknowledge the efforts that are being made, but what, if, you could, if you had a magic wand, what would you like to do? It's a great question. I mean, we, we, we feel uh, as an organisation we're passion, passionate about diversity in our employment and, and diversity around our customer base. And I think you'd recognise that when it comes to, uh, to, to disabilities and, and carrying passengers with disabilities, Qantas is probably at the forefront, certainly of any of the domestic carriers and what we do. Uh, we believe it is extremely important. Now, you can always do more. And we, you know, we've gone through cycles on this, and we've, we, we have uh, dedicated in the past some senior executives to work with uh, disabled uh, groups to make sure uh, that we are doing the right thing, that we are making sure uh, that we treat people with respect, uh, that we are putting the investment into training, we are putting the investment into procedures, and that we are doing the right things to make sure that we keep that lead. And I think, I, I know worldwide, because I've worked in the industry around the world, I think Qantas has and continues to do a lot more in this space than anybody else. But we need, we always need to improve. And I would never say that we've got this perfect. Uh, there are failures, and we know there are failures. We see them across the group at times. It upsets me unbelievably when I see them. And we'll do whatever we can to make sure we can iron them out and not, not for not to occur. It is core part of our brand. And while it may be a, a small customer segment, it's a very important one for us. So if we, it, we'll continue to keep that dialogue with disabled groups and we'd be very keen to keep on improving. Hi, Alan. Eric Noel from New Energy, a renewable energy company. Thanks again for your typically thorough speech which I've heard many times. Uh, just as an aside, in 1975 on this exact day, Qantas sent a 707 to evacuate myself and my family from Mauritius, which was wiped out by a cyclone. So thank you to Qantas and I've always flown them ever since. Uh, one thing you didn't touch on in your speech was Qantas and the environment, uh, which I was surprised about. Uh, as CEO of Qantas, you have control of some of the largest roof spaces in Australia through your hangars. You also have a very large carbon footprint. Are you going down the road and considering looking at solar power and micro wind energy to abate your carbon footprint? Yes, I mean, I mean we, we are working on projects across the whole organisation on reducing our carbon profit from footprint. It's a key uh, KPI for all of the management in the organisation. And we talked a bit about what we're doing uh, on the, the, our biggest part of our footprint by miles, 95% probably or more, is the CO2 emissions from the aircraft. Um, so that, that has to be our focus and the, 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 the activity I went through earlier is really uh, something we talk about all the time and focus in on about all the time. In terms of our own energy consumption, uh, we are, uh, have invested in a tri-generation facility to, to reduce our, our, our own energy consumption. We're, we're doing that initially in our mascot campus, which is a big area, and we plan to expand that across um, the operation. I see reports uh, every week on the amount of waste from our catering department, the amount of um, uh, water consumption that we use around the, uh, uh, around the company. We measure them and we've given ourselves very big targets. In most of those areas, the targets are 10% reduction this year and we're on track to get that 10% reduction and there is more that we can do. So uh, it's difficult in a speech like this to cover, you know, I picked some of the, the big priorities we want to talk about. I have in previous speeches talked about the environment. It's difficult to, to cover everything that you can cover, uh, but, but don't, don't read it as the environment isn't important. It absolutely is. And it's a big consideration for the aviation industry. We need to get this right. We know it. And we've committed uh, globally to huge target reductions. In our CO2 emission generally, uh, getting them reduced in aircraft is not easy. 
uh, we have a 1.5% reduction every year that we've committed to and IAT is committed to. Um, we, we believe that by the time we get to uh, 2020, we want our CO2 emissions uh, to be significantly below where they are today. Uh, so that's a 16% reduction. And then by the time it gets to 2050, we want it to be half of what it was in 2005. Um, and then all growth is carbon neutral is our plans. So they are very particular targets. And a lot of the things I talked about earlier have to happen before those targets can be realised. Hi, Alan. Geraldine Mitchell from Metro Trains. A um, couple of questions. You acknowledge the damage that has occurred to the brand as a result of the incidents from last year, and you said there's significant rebuilding required. Just a bit interested in how it is you hope to achieve that, given you also gave mention of what occurred in Cairo with the recognition of the kangaroo on the aircraft. And secondly, in regards to communication from your uh, pilots or captains to those on board, and again, you gave that example of the pilot coming out speaking to the people and giving his mobile phone. Do you see great benefit in that sort of personal interaction with a captain as opposed to what currently occurs on Qantas, which is streamlined announcements in regards to its operations? Yeah, that's, well, there's a few things there to cover off. Um, the, brand, the, brand, uh, the brand recovery, I think, uh, involves Qantas doing a number of things across a number of areas. Part of it's doing things like this, communicating exactly what the reality is. Um, we need to get the message out there because when there is a, a major incident like the QF32, and it was a major incident, it was significant, we grounded the fleet and we took safety as a number one priority. The, the, the format that happens is then there's a lot of interest in Qantas and every minor issue gets reported. Um, now, there, there, there is a, an issue for us to make sure we communicate that these are issues that occur on every airline around the world. Um, they are no different from what happens around the world and making sure people aren't losing confidence in us as a consequence of that, that intense report. And I can understand why it's reported. It is very newsworthy at the time. And this goes back, if you go back to 2008, when we had the aircraft with the oxygen cylinders that exploded, again, something outside of Qantas's control. We had a period of three months where every single incident was reported. You go back to the QF1, the aircraft that ran off the runway in Bangkok, again, a serious incident. We again had three months of every instance reported. The brand has always recovered after these, and we follow the same thing we always do. We make sure we communicate and people understand it. People don't get scared by it. Uh, we, we focus in on what we've always done to make sure people have the pride in the Qantas brand. So there's no hesitation when Australians are stranded for us to put our aircraft in. There's no hesitation for us to offer free flights to get them back home, because we'll get the reaction that we did over there where somebody will have that in there for the rest of their lives and will be a committed customer for us. And the passion that that generates in Qantas is, is quite amazing. And that's something uh, that we need to build on. We do need to build, we keep on investing in the marketing and the promotions here. Um, and being honest and transparent is the key thing in my mind. You know, we were completely, everything we knew was happening on the A380. We were open and we said it immediately we knew. Uh, and we got some criticism from that. Rolls-Royce didn't like us doing it. We felt they went to ground and we didn't like what they were doing. Uh, but we did uh, make sure that we kept the messages out there and I think it's a consistent approach of that. In terms of the pilots on the aircraft, it is harder than that because the pilots have a lot of work to do and uh, the PA is a very important part of what they do. And we do try to focus on making sure the pilots are encouraged to give as much information, uh, to, to communicate with the passengers on an ongoing basis. Some of them do it unbelievably well. So when I'm in an aircraft, I'll always go into the cockpit and tell the captain or the first officer, that was an amazing PA. You did a great job at it and you kept everybody informed. Some of them do it, don't do it as well because they want to fo focus on the flying and they're not as, as, as open as some other people have. We're working on it and we see it as a good, uh, important part of, of our customer service to make sure that interaction continues. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. It's Alan's first time at the Press Club in Melbourne. We hope it won't be the last. We'd be delighted to be able to welcome you back whenever you have some more free time, perhaps later in the year. Absolutely. And for members of the media, Alan will now do a doorstop in Garden Room 3, just out the door and down to your left. Would you please thank Alan Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.